Okay, so chapter number one. For this chapter alone, I'd prefer it if you use only my notes. You all can do a reading from the textbook, but if you all are finding that some parts of this chapter are difficult, you all can rely entirely on my notes. Remember, only for this chapter. Every other chapter, standard rule, notes, your own notes and textbook, you all have to read. Okay, so let me just give you a general overview of what this chapter number one is. Okay. Chapter number one, we divide it into two parts. So, part one has entirely to do with our sources of law. That is sources of Indian law. Okay, we have two types, two sources. That is, we'll call it as primary, and we'll have secondary sources. It will be in continuation of what we just did in the previous hour and uh, this is your part 1. Then part 2 will be entirely, I mean this entire chapter is theoretical but this is even more theory basically. We go to part 2 as a sort of history of law or in short we will call this as jurisprudence why we, we are following the law that we are following today okay and we we tend to study about five schools of thought that means over the past say thousand years different people came out and said this is only law this is what we will follow or this is what we will not follow etc so i will call it as five schools of thought Simply to put it across, one person said, I will only follow this law, I will not follow any other law. Whereas, whereas another person came and said, no, I will follow only those laws and I will not follow this law. And I don't mean persons, I mean over a period of time. Say for the past, for 200 years we followed whatever the British told us to, to do. Before that we had our own set of rules and regulations. Way before that, what did they follow? Many people said that we have a king. The king is made by God, so whatever the king says is the word of God and therefore it is the law. So multiple schools like that, we call that as schools of thought. What is law? Why did we follow them? Why we chose not to follow them? So this is your second part of this chapter. Okay, this is the, these are the only two parts. Normally from an exam point of view, this is important to the extent of uh, say 8 marks, maximum 8 marks. Normally, they will ask only one question from here. So, I will tell you to concentrate theory-wise from here and understanding the concept. Fine? <clears throat> In your notes, the first, the first part is only the five schools of thought. I am not going to start with that. I am going to go into the second half that is the sources of Indian law. So preferably, I'd, you can see it in here itself, it's more than enough, it's the same notes that I've shared with you. In your textbook, I'll tell you where each thing is, because they have given an introduction to the schools of thought, then they've gone into sources of law, then again they've come back into schools of thought. So the time being, no, no need to look into your textbook. Okay, let's start. First we have sources of Indian law. Sources of Indian law, who makes the laws? Legislature. So they are the main source of our Indian laws. And that is what we call as statutes and legislation. Remember I said statute, legislation, act, law. All of these four words mean the same thing. That is law made by legislature. Then the second one that we have is something known as judicial precedents. Not president of India, president. Okay. While this refers to the legislature, this is given by the judiciary. So the primary sources of law are from the law made by legislature by judicial precedents. The third one that we have is customs. 
because our country is rich with customs rich with heritage culture all of it and okay how many of you all are christians here i don't worry it's no difference in thing i'm just like trying to understand any muslims in this class jains buddhists hindus everyone hindus okay fine all right so as hindus we tend to have certain customs to follow during marriage at the time of birth at the time that we get uh, sorry marriage when we have children we have certain customs muslims will have certain customs that re relates to their personal laws if you are a jain there are some customs with regards to the food that you eat um punjabi people tend to wear a turban or i don't have i don't i'm not using the exact words but they wear a turban it is customary for kugi men men from kug to carry to carry knives or to wear that particular weapon on them these are all different kinds of customs around when we get married what do we do as hindus we walk around the fire and there is a custom there are many customs of the husband keeping the kumkum on the on the wife's forehead over here all examples of customs only so just because a law is there can we completely disregard customs the answer is no but what if we had a custom of stealing stealing there there was a tribe or a community in india where their main livelihood was by stealing things from other people it, for age long they practiced it so that does that make it a custom it is a custom but it's just not allowed by our laws okay we can we have a custom of human sacrifice it could have existed but do we allow it by law the answer is no so that we have customs over here and then we have lastly personal laws india would probably be the only country in the entire world where we have separate laws based on which religion that you follow laws apply differently to hindus laws apply differently to muslims and laws apply differently to christians okay so am i saying that if a christian murders a person he will be punished differently as compared to a hindu who has murdered a person no i'm not talking from that perspective i'm talking purely from the from the perspective of birth marriage um say succession guardianship such kind of things so let's say in hindu in hindu customs it is the mother who is the natural legal guardian of the child but then for islam you have the father who is the natural legal guardian of the child things like this will vary so that's why we call it as personal laws personal laws are they also laws yes but it's just that we're dividing them on the basis of the religion that you follow now i know many questions are there in your head ma'am isn't this discrimination etc etc we will address this issue when we come to constitution of india and no it is not discrimination okay we live in we live in study some case laws where problems have come up as a result of it but that's for a later stage okay so first we'll go into primary source that is statutes and legislation now statutes and legislation there is only one thing that you need to understand it is law made by legislature plain and simple but remember i told you when i was explaining acts rules and regulations that the act is made by the legislature whereas the rules are delegated to some other authority or it is delegated to someone else to say follow so and so procedure that is what we're going to be studying over here please read this with me statute law is what is created as legislation it is sometimes called as jus scriptum that is written law or jus non scriptum that is unwritten law so law is divided between jus scriptum and jus non scriptum okay when we call it as written law is what we call as law legislation act and statute that is 
it is written by legislature whereas just non scriptum or unwritten law is what we call as customs customs we study as a separate topic customs are the practices that we follow on a daily basis that if it is in accordance with our laws then we will make it a law itself otherwise like say custom of stealing a custom of uh, killing custom of human sacrifice these things will not be allowed by law okay so this is the first differentiation just scriptum and just non scriptum we are looking only at just scriptum over here in just scriptum we are looking at something known as supreme legislation and subordinate legislation break it down what is legislation law so there is something known as a supreme law and there is something known as a subordinate law what is the difference between the two for this you have to come back don't read what's here yet you have to come back to the constitution of india okay a constitution is the main law it's the mother of all laws okay so a constitution constitutes the main nobody can go above the constitution everyone is under the constitution so if you see in our constitution itself it the constitution itself creates certain authorities take for example the position of the president of india the president forms the executive body of state okay it creates the judiciary which is the judicial body of state then it allows for parliament and state legislative assemblies to exist but apart from that the constitution also allows say a gst council to exist directly the constitution says that there shall be a gst council it shall consist of so many members so the supreme sorry the constitution of india itself is creating an authority it's creating a body or it's creating a position okay and all of these people i'll call them as the supreme authority when these authorities make law we call that as supreme legislation okay but say parliament decides to delegate their power to say a ministry of corporate affairs to formulate rules for company law aspects then they're taking a little bit of their power and they're giving it to the ministry of corporate affairs ministry of corporate affairs is not does not have its power from the constitution it gets its power from somewhere else and therefore this ministry of corporate affairs is a delegated authority and when a delegated authority makes laws we call that as a delegated legislation okay so let me break it up again for you the there is only one person who can actually make laws that is your parliament but when if someone other than the parliament is making laws then we'll call them as a other authority in in terms of the legal language we call parliament as the supreme authority and we call the <coughs> say ministry of corporate affairs as the other authority in other words the delegated authority when they make laws respectively we call it as supreme legislation or delegated legislation so let me give you more examples of uh, these things okay parliament makes law is it supreme uh, supreme uh, legislation or delegated legislation we call that as supreme legislation any order passed by the president of india supreme legislation you all you all are all going to some sort of university college <coughs> universities can make their own rules if a university makes a rule then is it supreme le uh, legislation or delegated legislation 
delegated legislation but why delegated it's another authority exactly means i'll call delegated legislation as anything other than supreme legislation because it's supreme only if it gets its power from the constitution if it doesn't get its power from the constitution then it's another authority okay um have you all heard of these um, clubs like cosmo club bangalore club um club memberships i don't mean like partying clubs i mean like those formal institutions okay you have heard of that right when you enter into a club there are many rules dress codes what shoes you should wear women should wear these clothes men should wear these clothes there are certain etiquettes also getting membership into these clubs and all are very very high i mean you have to pay a lot of fees waiting time is a lot things like that if these clubs make rules what is it supreme or delegated delegated only simple rule is that what are clubs clubs are just created by us they're not some lawful authority but we have to follow their rules so it's delegated legislation now what is a municipality corporation what is a corporation like can you think of where they get their power from they they come under the state government okay so are they supreme or delegated who are all saying supreme authority one two who saying delegated why delegated does not come directly under the constitution only center and state government that is parliament and state legislative assembly are created by the constitution itself but your municipalities are given authority under respective state governments okay so they come under delegated authority now we have uh, we have ministry of corporate affairs supreme authority or delegated authority delegated authority okay so this is the difference between supreme and delegated so we look at the definition supreme legislation is that which proceeds from the sovereign power that is the highest power in the state and which derives its power directly from its from the constitution whereas subordinate legislation is anything which proceeds from the authority other than sovereign power that is the exact opposite of supreme uh point number 2 it cannot be rep repealed annulled controlled by anyone other than legislative authority i'll explain this when a law is made it can only be deleted by the parliament itself parliament makes the laws parliament can delete the laws it can amend the laws it can do whatever it wants okay any other authority does not have that power so generally we will say the supreme authority has the power to make the laws as well as to uh, repeal the laws to remove the laws or to even amend it okay whereas for subordinate legislation it is dependent on some other superior authority for its continued existence i told you company companies act the rules cannot exist separately from the companies act itself means your company's incorporation rules cannot exist separately from the companies act itself companies act can exist on its own without any rules okay what are rules delegated legislation main act is supreme legislation <coughs> now example is parliament of india possesses the supreme authority and for subordinate legislation i'm not given examples over here but this point i'll explain little later on okay all your university clubs municipality mca these are all examples of your delegated legislation okay we'll be looking more into concept of supreme and de i mean mainly delegated legislation when we come to administrative law okay right? okay um
we have now established that the legislature is the one that makes the main laws. But we are studying the topic sources of law, sources of primary law. Legislature can pass it, but the second point that we have is judicial precedents. Precedents are also otherwise known as the judgments or decisions. Okay. How can judiciary end up making the law? Remember when we were discussing the functions of each authority, we said legislature makes the laws, judiciary does what? Interpretation of laws to give judgments, to decide disputes, to hear, to I mean to resolve disputes basically. Okay. Now, how am I saying that they are making laws over here? Are you understanding the concept? Even though legislature is the main law making authority, the judiciary also has some aspect of law making. How? Through the concept of precedence. So now I am going to come back into a lot of detail about how the courts actually work with regards to Supreme Court and High Court. Okay. First, let's start at the Supreme Court. We said there is only one Supreme Court. Now tell me, is there only one Supreme Court judge sitting in Delhi hearing out all the judgments? No. We have? We have? Only three judges? Only five or seven? Exactly. Okay, so we have in the Supreme Court building itself, we have many court halls. Okay, one court hall number one will have the, the Chief Justice of India and he will be sitting with either one other person or two, I mean, three other people, five, seven, like that. So that's what I'm trying to explain over here. In the Supreme Court, we have something known as a single judge bench. Judge. The word I'm using is bench. What is a bench? Hmm? No. Ordinary English meaning. Bench. Desk or somewhere to sit on. That is exactly what it means. How many judges are sitting on that bench? That's all it actually means. So we have only one judge sitting. We call it as a single judge bench. But when two judges are sitting, we call it as a division bench. Okay. Then we can also have three. So we'll call that as three judge bench. Can we have four? Hmm? Someone said. Can we have four judges sitting? Anyone saying yes? Should be an odd number. Why? If two people are in favor, then the other two will be in not in favor. So then we'll be stuck at a what to do? Half are in favor, the other half are not. So therefore, after like you may ask, ma'am, division benches then two judges only. No, what about that? It's still okay because even though both judges can have differing opinions they will have the Chief Justice of India coming in to be the concluding vote if they are two differing positions. But it can be that both the judges are in favour of one person or in favour of the other. So that is not a problem. After 3, you have only 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, however you want, if you, if you can find the judges that is. Okay. Now, how does it work between single division, three judge, five, seven, etc.? If, say, a 13 judge bench gave a decision, okay, a decision given by a 13 judge bench is binding on all the other courts. A decision given by 11 judge bench is binding on all other benches. Okay? But 
a decision given by a single judge bench or a division bench is not binding on a higher bench okay it's simple it's like how we studied in high court supreme court and uh, i mean supreme court high court and district court decision given by the district court applies only to the district court but a decision given by a high court will apply both to the high court as well as the lower courts a decision given by supreme court will be applicable to the entire country right now the same thing in the supreme court the more the number of judges their decision is more binding as compared to the lesser number of judges now you may ask ma'am how are you even saying that because when we go to the supreme court we can go only once so how are you saying that more judges is greater than a smaller judge bench what am i talking about okay for this try to understand it this way in 2017 guys i'm talking about an example now in 2017 gst was rolled out gst goods and services tax igst sgst cgst all of it now again this is purely an example does it's not actually applicable they said that all vegetables attract an 18% gst okay great so it's fine but we have a mr a who is a tomato trader and so he decides tomato is not a vegetable it is a fruit i will not pay gst this is what he decides and he continues like that what does what happens over here gst sends him a notice pay up 18% gst he is like why should i pay up gst you only said vegetables no mine is a fruit so i don't have to pay tax this will end up where in court now let's say it's gone all the way to the supreme court and here the supreme court has given a decision saying that tomato is a vegetable he would have gone to a low court high court and then finally he would have gone to a supreme court the supreme court in the supreme court there were this was a three judge bench okay three judges sat and they heard this out and they decided to and they decided that see i am going to interpret this law whatever you are whatever your confusions are about vegetables especially about tomato tomato is a vegetable and he, they have directed this tomato trader to pay up the tax okay when was this this decision given let's say this case happened in the year 2018 fine now fast forward to the year 2024 in 2024 a mr x goes ahead and something similar on similar grounds he has not paid gst because he is saying that no my my thing is not a vegetable mine is only a fruit okay this time mr x has been sent a notice by gst and they are there before the lower court okay the district court now the district court is like i have nothing to tell you other than follow the decision of the supreme court judgment because the supreme court has already told in 2018 there's no confusion these are all vegetables you have to pay tax on that but mr x has the right of appeal so he goes up to the high court now high court is also like see buddy i am bound by the decision of the supreme court i can't change my decision for you and so see district court rules in favor of gst high court also rules in favor of gst only but when mr x again goes on appeal to the supreme court this time supreme court there's a five judge bench in sitting if there is a five judge bench are they bound by the decision of a three judge bench no right so that means this same supreme court can change the decision given in 2018 and rule in favor of mr x every other court was bound by the decision of the supreme court but in the supreme court itself a lower judge bench is not bound by the decision of a higher judge bench so in this case the supreme court in, can come out and pass a new decision stating that no this particular thing is not a vegetable and does not attract tax 
they can change it entirely now which which will which decision will the courts follow will they follow the 2018 judgment or the 2024 judgment they will follow the 2024 judgment the latest decisions okay this is how or uh, this is what a precedent is in the supreme court here gave a judgment this judgment was followed at like six years later by the district court by the high court we call this judgment as a precedent okay similarly this supreme court would also given a judgment this judgment is what i call as a precedent and a precedent is nothing other than a judge's interpretation of the law okay so looking back we have law made by the legislature and law also includes interpretation by the judiciary and this is your second source of law have you all understood the concept for only if there is a law we can interpret it so our main source is definitely legislation but from that the judges because there may be many confusions like this okay is tomato a vegetable or a fruit does this apply this way or does that apply that way there be a lot of confusions so for that interpretation we go to the judges when a judge gives his decision we call that as a judge made law or a judicial precedent and how does this precedent work is that this precedent works for all the lower courts and across time so decision given by a supreme court in 2015 will still be applicable to all the decisions given in 2017 18 19 until the same supreme court decides to change the decision with a higher judge bench now you'll have understood this concept of benches more the number more the power of the of the judgment lesser the number lesser the power of judgment but generally any decision given by the supreme court like let's say a single judge bench of a supreme court will still be binding on the on the high court and the lower courts okay everyone clear on this any questions no fine um okay we are moving on to an example number 2 We will go with my initial example that is Mr. A lends money to a Mr. B of say 1 crore rupees. Okay. Mr. A is located in Coimbatore whereas Mr. A, Mr. B is from Bangalore. Okay. Now we will follow the same, um, the, the same facts as last time that is Mr. A lent the money and then he, Mr. B did not pay it back within the required time. So what happens over here is Mr. A decides to go to court. Now when he goes to court, he decides to file a suit, one in Coimbatore and he also decides to file a suit in uh, say in Bangalore. Can he do that? Why? Yeah, correct. But what if I am not happy with the decision given by the Coimbatore court? Go only for appeal. Okay, but no, I am generally posing the question to all of you all, okay? Can I file the same case in two separate courts? No. Why? You are trying to get a better judgment. You think Coimbatore district court is very, very strict, but then Bangalore is a little lenient. So let's file cases in both places and then. Exactly. One second. Uh, repeat. Okay. You don't know which court to go to. Let's assume that you know which court to go to and you still go to both the courts. Okay. There are two courts given 
या कन्फ्यूजन करेक्ट ओके वॉट वी यू सिंग या या करेक्ट they bound to each other no my general question is can you go to the two separate courts for the same case no i can i want to do that because one will have a better better judgment than the other but the answer is i cannot do that okay simply because two different courts will give two di different judgments this court can rule in favor of the defendant this court can rule in favor of the complainant and this is a huge problem because people still do it today they'll go to one court they'll alternatively go to the second court and file the same suit there will be confusion okay now think of it not just from this example think of it from a high court level let's say supreme court gave the decision over here i'm talking about vegetable like tomatoes a vegetable decision supreme court gave over here okay uh what if a high court gives a decision let's say tamil nadu high court gives one decision and the karnataka high court gives some other decision then which one do we follow is my question clear anyone okay in which premises he is doing the business okay okay for high court okay okay it's it's somewhat valid but we'll study about that later but can you all understand the difference there is a confusion as to which courts decisions to follow which court to go to these kind of questions have caused huge confusion in our in our court systems so they decided okay listen we'll follow one standard rule supreme court decisions is is applicable across the entire country but what happens when we come across to i'll remove this example sorry when we have high courts okay a decision given by say tamil nadu high court is binding on all the lower courts in tamil nadu only any decision given by the karnataka high court is binding only on the lower courts in karnataka so let's say that you decide to go to a court in tamil nadu you go on appeal to a high court then which high court will you go to first you go to the court in tamil nadu then you can only go on appeal to which court tamil nadu high court can you go on appeal to karnataka high court no within your state only you're going up then from the high court only you're going to the supreme court okay so obviously it stands to stay, state that a decision given by the by your respective high court is binding on you you cannot say that no no karnataka high court said this so therefore it is applicable to me no it doesn't work that way however decisions of a karnataka high court merely have a persuasive value okay so i'll give you an example for this let's say that i uh, okay in 2017 directors many directors got disqualified okay this was because in 2013 when the companies act came out there was a clause over there it said that if a company does not file its annual returns for three consecutive years then the directors of the respective companies will get disqualified in all the companies that they are they are directors in so let's say i am a director in three companies 
two of the companies have filed annual returns properly no problem but one company didn't file it but i was a director in it and because of that reason itself my director i mean my directorship i got disqualified and so directors got disqualified throughout the country some close to 80000 directors got disqualified in one day okay do directors live only in one state no we have many people who are directors across the country so they started approaching their respective high courts okay and to follow the same example of tamil nadu and karnataka high court karnataka high court came out and they gave a decision stating that okay the order for disqualification okay pause it for the time being for the time being put a pause to it and they were like we'll hear we'll hear all the decisions and then we'll continue but for the time being this director is not to be disqualified okay this was given as a decision by the karnataka high court but sim on a similar grounds a director from tamil nadu approached the tamil nadu high, uh, high court and there the court is like nothing doing order is valid you are disqualified so it is the exact opposite of the decision given in the karnataka high court isn't it unfair now people living in karnataka get a better decision people living in tamil nadu now get a worse decision what to do now go and appeal to the supreme court that is one remedy or one high court like let's say before the tamil nadu high court if i am that director i can go before before the judge and say your honor in karnataka on this particular date a, a judgment was given stating that the order for disqualification has to be stopped for the time being okay and that directors are not disqualified kindly consider the same and pass a judgment so we are requesting the judge please take into consideration that is what i call as a persuasive value okay when it is in persuasive in nature my tamil nadu high court can be like okay fine for the sake of uniformity i'll follow whatever the karnataka high court is saying or if my judge feels like nothing doing this is my decision he can give this this decision also now consequently one delhi high court can come out because there also someone would have gone to the court delhi high court can choose to follow the decision of karnataka high court okay or say one rajasthan high court can come out and choose to follow whatever was said by tamil nadu high court between high courts there is only persuasive value so even though it is causing some confusion sadly all high courts have the same power they can choose to come out with different decisions but you can ask them to consider each other's decision this is what we call as persuasive precedence okay where you are asking in another judge kindly consider the decision of the other court fine okay guys quick recap we are looking at precedence precedence are made purely by the judiciary only the judiciary can do it what is precedence it's basically judgments a decision of the court so when a court comes to a decision it is an interpretation of the law and when it's an interpretation of the law it becomes part of our primary law a primary sources of law fine this is a fairly large topic but very very important also moving forward so now i'm coming to the third part of the same precedence okay this is a very quick break up of what happens in a court of law even if you have questions just keep it for little later on okay um <clears throat> we will stick to the same examples for the time being mr a loaned out to mr b mr b did not pay the money back okay now we have gone to a court of law now when you go before a court of law put yourself in the position of a mr a when you go before the court of law you are approaching the court saying that your honor this person has violated some of my rights so call him to the court and pass judgment correct so mr a will approach the respective court of law now the court is like okay tell me your side of the story mr a will produce all the facts produce all the evidence he will give his side of the story saying that 
I lent so much money. After I lent money, after five years, this person has not paid it back. Great. Now the court will call Mr. B to court itself. And he will say, now tell me your version of the story. Now Mr. B, Mr. B will say that, Your Honor, we entered into another agreement. That agreement stated that instead of paying back the loan, I will grant him shares in my company. And therefore, I needn't have paid any money back. So his entire complaint is invalid. Anything. It can be some form of a defense. Now the court is like one man is saying he's given money. The other man is saying that no, I needn't pay back the money. There's an alternating view. Okay. So what the court will be like? Okay, fine. Mr. A and Mr. B produce evidence. Prove it. If you're saying you gave one crore rupees, show me the bank receipt. Show me the chalan. However, you transfer the money to him. Show me proof of that. Or to Mr. B, he'll say like, you enter into an agreement. No, give me a copy of the agreement. I, I wish to see it too. So the court will collect evidence. Then what will the court do? The court will hear the arguments of both parties, hear both sides. And then after hearing, the, hearing both sides, listening to the evidence, he will give a judgment. Can I say that this process is fair? This view is fair. He has heard everything. Logically, he has come to a conclusion. This part of the judgment, we have a name for it. We call it as the ratio decidendi. It's a Latin word and something that you will have to learn over time. Ratio decidendi. It refers to it is a part of the judgment. Wherein the court is saying, I have heard all the facts, I have heard all the evidence and I am giving this particular decision. However, while he is giving this judgment, right, he also goes on to say, he has a personal opinion somewhere in this judgment. He claims that, see, it is, the judge is saying this, he's like, it's my personal opinion that um, loans should not be converted into equity shares. Just for example sake. Loans must be repaid in full and must not encourage its conversion into other forms. I'm just making up this example. The, the judge has his personal opinion. Maybe he has bad, uh, I don't know, experiences with money or something like that. And he, and he says that this, is, this should be the practice to be followed. A personal opinion of the judge does not hold a lot of value. Because it's, like I said, his personal opinion. What if it was a matter relating to uh, divorce or a matter relating, a family matter? Some judges may be like very pro, pro women. Some judges may be pro non women or pro like whatever else. So then their personal opinions can affect each judgment and that is not fair to the people. So therefore they'll say that this personal opinion, which is part of the judgment does not, sorry, does not constitute the precedent. Okay. So, one thing that you can understand from all of this is that precedent is given by the judges. It is a judgment. This judgment can have two parts. The rational part known as the ratio decidendi as well as a personal opinion. This personal opinion, uh, sorry, the rational part is what is to be carried forward as precedent. Whereas the personal opinion does not concern anyone. We, we should not look into the personal opinion of judges as precedent and therefore we need not follow it forward. Okay. So guys, I'll stop here. After lunch, we'll, we'll look, I'll give you some more examples with these concepts and we'll look into the types of precedents and continue. Uh, before we stop, any questions so far? No. 
प्रेसिडेंट या या इट्स नॉट पॉसिबल बट मे बी आफ्टर लंच आई गिव यू सिचुएशन ऑफ वॉट कैन हैपन ओके बट नो इट्स नॉट पॉसिबल इफ यू आर गोइंग टूवर्ड्स वन कोर्ट यू टू फॉलो यू टू फॉलो लाइक दैट स्टेट्स कोर्ट्स अंटिल यू गोइंग टू द सुप्रीम कोर्ट यू कैन गो फ्रॉम तमिलनाडु डिस्ट्रिक्ट कोर्ट टू कर्नाटका हाई कोर्ट दैट इज नॉट अलाउड एनी अदर क्वेश्चन ओके वील स्टॉप फॉर लंच नाउ आई सी यू आई लाइक वॉट वन ओ क्लॉक One only, no?